Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. So for this lecture, we will be talking about the second part. We already finished the first part of the upper limb injury. Now we will move to the elbow, forearm, wrist, and the hand. So the anatomy of the ulna and the radius, as you all know, this is the anterior view. You can see here the radial bone, the distal radius, proximal radius. This is the radial head. And we have the neck, then the tuberosity. In the shaft, in the diaphyseal area, we have a radial bow, which is the angulation you can see in here. In the distal radius, we have the styloid, and we have the distal radio ulna joint. Then we move to the ulna. In the ulna, we have the styloid process of the ulna, we have the head of the ulna, and we have the ulnar notch in this side that's articulating with the uh, radio ulnar joint. So if you go proximally now to the shaft, you will end up here by the olecranon which is articulating at the elbow, at the bony part. We have the trochlea here, and we have the uh, coronoid process. So this is the basic anatomy, and for sure we have the proximal radio ulnar germ. Between the radius and the ulna, we have the intraosseous or interosseous membrane. So this is the basic anatomy. Posteriorly, this is as you can see. Yeah, as you all know, the movements that are being done by the elbow is flexion and extension, which is a hinged joint. On the radius and the ulna, there is pronation and supination. Pronation and supination. The radius is going over the ulna. So uh, as you can see in here, distally, you can see here the head of the ulna, it's articulating with the distal radius within uh, this fossa, which is called the ulnar notch. And here are the places that the carpal bones are articulating with the distal radius. Okay, fractures of the radius of the ulna, it's very, very common. The mechanism of injury and the pathology, usually it's twisting force because there is pronation and supination with compression or axial load. Um, so it's either twisting, angulation, or direct blow. Some additional rotational deformities, because in the upper third, as you all know, the biceps, the biceps and the supinator muscles are working in the proximal third, so they are deforming forces. We have in the middle third the pronator teres and the lower third the pronator quadratus. Don't forget always in the forearm injuries the risk of compartment syndrome. The risk of compartment syndrome. So this is an important picture showing you here the pronator teres muscles. So if the fracture is proximal. There are, there are some rules that we have to follow. If it's distal, we have to follow another rules. This is the supinator muscle, and this is the pronator quadratus. And as you can see in the picture, the radius is going over the ulna to do the pronation and supination. Um, for sure, we can do as any bone x-rays. We have to get always two views, AP and lateral. In children, most probably, they're going to break in a green stick fracture because more elasticity. In adults, mostly, it's going to be displaced. And the two bones, when they are fractured, we have to know the level because both bone fracture could be at the same level. It will be very unstable and it could be on different level. For example, the ulna is fractured proximally and the radius is distally, for example. So these are not the same level. It's more stable than the same level. If it's low energy, it's gonna give you transverse or oblique, high energy, comminuted or segmental. X-ray showing uh, pediatric both bone fracture. You can see here fracture from one side hinging on the other side, which is a green stick fracture. But if you look at the X-ray, the angle in here, if you look at the angle, it's not acceptable. So we have to reduce. We have to do reduction and splinting. This is an adults, both bone fracture. This side is comminuted. This side is transverse. This is giving you an indication that this is a high energy trauma. So what will you think about? Compartment syndrome. Okay, for the roles I told you about, you've seen the uh, pronator teres muscles. I'm gonna show you again. This is the pronator teres muscle. You can see the insertion in here, okay, in the radius. So if the fracture is, is, if the fracture is proximal to the insertion, Okay, it's very important to know that the action of the biceps will be working. So the proximal frag uh, fragment of the radius is supinated, so it will be supinated for the action of the biceps, okay, and flexed because of unopposed action of the biceps, okay, and the supinator for sure. That's why when you want 
to put a back slab or you want to do reduction and splint, you have to put the back slab while the hand is supinated. Okay, so you are following the distal part for the proximal because the proximal the biceps is working. So you are doing pronation, supination. So you are putting the bones together. Now, on the other hand, if it's in the middle third, so it's distal to pronator tear uh, insertion, the proximal fragment is held in a neutral position. That's why we put the back slab in a neutral position. You don't, you don't have to do either supination or pronation. So it's a neutral, it's in midway. Okay, for treatment in children, usually, usually in children, because mostly it's green stick, closed reduction is usually successful and you put a back slab. The back slab should cross two joints. So the back slab for the forearm should be hitting the elbow to the axilla and uh, over the wrist. So you have to reach the level of the metacarpophalangeal joints. Okay, so this is the back slab you put, which is very long for sure. Um, for sure, six weeks, you put the back slab, then you evaluate your patient again by x-ray and physical examination. Um, if the fracture reduction is unacceptable, as you remember from the last lectures, that each fracture has angles that we call acceptable reduction. If it's not acceptable, you have to go and reduce. If it's not getting reduced as you want, sometimes you have to go to open reduction internal fixation or closed reduction with intramedullary loads or nails. So for pediatric age groups, if you want to fix the both bone, we have specific uh, metal or specific maneuvers we use for these pediatric age group, which called the Nancy nails or the intramedullary rods, the elastic nails. So these nails we put inside the radius or the ulna or both, but we have to avoid the growth plates. No nails, no screws, no plates are going through the growth plates because it will be affecting the growth and it will cause growth disturbances. Um, okay, this is the angles that we should respect when we are doing the reduction. So relation between the age angulation remodeling for childhood. If the angle is more than 15 below six years, this is not acceptable. So we accept up to 15 years. From six to 12 years, we accept up to 10. And after that, it's like, the others okay because there will be no or mild remodeling that's why the angle is getting lower and lower the pediatric age group are called the for forgiving bone okay cool x-rays so if you see on x-ray a this is a fracture okay which 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 one is this this is the radius this is the ulna. so we have a proximal one third diaphyseal transverse fracture in both bone, in the radius and in the ulna. What has been done that the surgeon chosen two rods, two Nancy nails, two elastic nails. Why they are elastic? Because we can't bend them, okay? So they use two elastic nails and put them inside the intramedullary cavities for the radius and the ulna. And if you can see the insertion where the surgeon finished is just beneath the epiphyseal plate. You see in here, the rod did not pass through the epiphyseal plate because if it passes through the epiphyseal plate, there will be growth disturbances, okay? This is the follow-up X-ray, as you can see here, the fracture fully healed, then the metal was removed, they removed the nails, and you can see the fracture is healed. Uh, for the adults, sometimes it's hard to do cross reduction, especially if it was on the same level, it's very unstable. That's why we have to go and do open reduction and internal fixation. We fix with plates and screws. Why plates and screws? This is a unique information for the forearm fractures. We consider the forearm fractures for the radius and the ulna sometimes as intraarticular fractures. And as you remember from the last lectures, intraarticular fractures means anatomical reduction and rigid fixation for absolute stability. So we have to use plates or screws. That's why we go and fix the both bone with plates or screws. And sometimes if it's comminuted or something, we can use some bone graft. Um, a good information that we don't, we don't suture the deep fascia because it's increasing the risk of the compartment syndrome. 
Um, post-operatively, for sure, you have to keep your arm elevated, exercise, but not lifting or contact sport. No contact sport, please, for, uh, from 8 to 12 weeks until the bone completely united. This is a nice X-ray showing two plates are put for the radius and ulna fracture. Okay, complications. We already talked about the complications of, uh, of the fractures. Nerve injuries, posterior interosseous nerve, uh, neurovascular radial or ulnar artery, and don't forget compartment syndrome. Uh, for the late, delayed union, non-union, usually in the adults, not in the pediatric age group. Malunion, if you chose and close the reduction and the reduction was not okay, there will be malunion. And complications of plate removal. This is a common question from the patients to you, to the surgeon, for you as a doctor. Should I remove the implants or not? Usually, usually the answer, if you are an adult, just leave it inside. It's not going to make you any problems. If there is no problem, no need to remove it. Because removing any implant is a surgery, you will go through anesthesia, it's an incision, you may get refracture, and you will return to square zero, you may get infections, and so on. So usually we don't um, advise our patients to remove any implant unless there is an indication, okay? In the pediatric age group, it's a bit different. Most of the time we remove the implants because they are growing. Single bone fracture. It's either the radius or the ulna. The ulna is more common than the radius. We have a special fracture, which is called night stick fracture, because uh, the policeman, when he wants to get someone who's uh, robbing a place or something, and he wants to give him a hit with a stick, the first thing to do, that the patient will put his arm to protect himself, and the first one to be in the face of the blow is the ulna. So it's going to be direct trauma, and then that will give you transverse fracture in the ulna, it's called night stick fracture. This is the fracture as you can see in the picture. Um, okay, they are very important because many reasons. Number one, dislocations may be undiagnosed. That's why it's very important, it's mandatory when you ever see a fracture, radius or ulna, look proximal and distal. You remember the role of two for the x-rays, two joints, two limbs, two occasions, two opinions you have to look for the joint above and the joint below because it's very common to see a dislocation in the distal radioulnar joint or proximal. So you have to look for the joints. The other thing, non-union is liable occur unless it's realized that one bone takes just as long to consolidate as two. Okay, it's easily missed, okay, especially for one bone. On x-ray in transverse in children, you can see some plastic deformation sometimes, green stick fractures, without a breaking. If the, if the reduction is acceptable, you just put them in the brace. If it's unacceptable, you have to go and do reduction, then you put your brace on. If it's irreducible, unacceptable reduction, you can use closed reduction with uh, intramedullary nails. If it did not work, you can go for open reduction with internal fixation. Uh, this is a fracture for the ulna alone. This is a distal one-third diaphyseal fracture. And you can see here it's a transverse fracture because it's just less than 30 degrees with the axis of the ulna. And you can see there is an angle between the proximal and the distal end. So if you take this line, you can see that there is an angle. It's about 30 degrees. So you will think now, is it acceptable or it's not acceptable? Length, alignment, and rotation. Another time, length, alignment, and rotation we have to restore. Okay, now we're gonna go for the specific fractures for the forearm, the most common of the forearm or the most important, the Montegia and Gagliese. So we will start with Montegia fracture. So Montegia, by definition on X-ray, any fracture of the ulna associated with dislocation of the radiocapitellar joint. Okay, so it's a fracture of the ulna associated with dislocation of the radiocapitellar joint including the trans olecranon fracture in which the proximal radio ulnar joint remains intact. So AP and lateral always, always AP and lateral. Let's take an example. So the mechanism of injury, usually the patient will fall down with the arm usually pronated, okay? And it will cause him the injury. So we have four types of Montegia fracture, which is an ulna fracture with radial head dislocation, okay? So either the ulna is fractured proximally with the radial head is going anteriorly or ventrally. Okay, this is type one. 
How can I know that the radius is dislocated? As simple as that. The radius is always pointing to the capitella. If the radius is not pointing to the capitella on the lateral view, so this is a dislocation. So type 1 is going anterior, type 2 is going posterior, type 3 is going lateral, type 4, both bone fracture, as simple as that. So this is type 1, most common, anterior. Type 2, posterior dislocation of the radial head and ulnar fracture. Type 3, ulnar fracture with lateral dislocation. And finally, it could have both bone fractures with dislocation of the radial head, the least common, because it means more uh, trauma. Um, trans olecranon fracture also can give you the same. Ulnar deformity is usually obvious, but dislocation of the head is masked by swelling. So the ulnar fracture, you can see it very easy. Sometimes you can't see the radial head dislocation. That's why physical examination is very important. A useful clue is pain and tenderness on the lateral aspect of the elbow at the head of radius. Uh, the wrist and the hand should be examined too. Please always examine the wrist and the hand. Don't forget, like roll of two, you have to examine the whole limb, okay? Especially for radial nerve injury. For treatment, the key of successful treatment, the key of successful treatment, restore the length of the ulna. So, length alignment rotation, again, length alignment rotation. This is always for fracture. You have to restore length alignment and rotation. Only then can dislocated joint be fully reduced. So you cannot reduce a radial head easily unless you restore the length of the ulna. So the first step, reduce the ulna to the normal length, the radius will be easily reduced. The other way around, it's so difficult and it's impossible sometimes. Um, irreducible fractures, it's time to go for surgery. Complications. Radial dislocation, it might get neuropraxia, and we will talk about the neuropraxia and the neurotemesis. We will talk about the nerve injuries in a specific lecture. So neuropraxia is, an, is a reversible injury to the nerve that makes loss of function. It may take up to six months to recover. We only observe for these patients, malunion and nonunion. Especially for children, as we mentioned many times, it can be green stick or plastic deformation, always, give two limbs to compare. Incomplete fracture, if it's not uh, reduced well, go and reduce it. If it's complete, do fixation with intramedullary nail, which is Nancy, sorry, Nancy nail or elastic nail, especially for pediatric age group. We're done with Montegia, let's go to Gilyazi. So Gilyazi, the difference is it's called a trampoline fracture, because usually the patient fall from a trampoline. He wants to protect himself with the superimposed rotation forces. It's a distal radius. Okay, it's radial fracture, distal radius fracture with radio ulnar joints, subluxated or dislocated. So Montegia is in the proximal, Gilyazi is in the distal. Gilyazi is much more common than uh, Montegia. Prominence and tenderness over the lower end of the ulna for sure. Sometimes, because the dislocation of the radio ulnar joint, because the radius and the ulna, they have a joint between them, if the radius and the ulna are dislocated from the joint, the ulna will go dorsally. So you will see it prominent in here. And you have a specific sign that it's called piano key sign by balloting on the ulna. So when you press the ulna, it's going down like a key. And when you remove your hand, the ulna goes up again. So this is called piano key sign, which gives you an indication for a distal radio ulnar joint dislocation. Important note, always compare the two sides because sometimes because of the hyperlaxity, because the ligaments are holding this joint. So because of the hyperlaxity, you do pollutment, you, you think that it's a positive piano key sign. Going on the other side, you'll see, ah, it's normal, it's comparable. That's why you have to do it on the both sides. For sure, nerve lesions, ulnar nerve injury, you have to examine. You can see here an X-ray showing a distal one-third radial fracture. Distal one-third divisal radial fracture is a transverse one. Okay, you can see a translation, complete translation. Okay, there is a mild angulation in here. If you take the angle in here and this one, it's about 10, 15 degrees, full translation. And you can see the radio ulnar joint, it's overlapped. So it may give you an indication that it is subluxated or dislocated. For sure, you need another view, which is the lateral. Um, 
length alignment rotation you have to restore length alignment and rotation okay for sure in adults sometimes you have to do open reduction internal fixation and make sure that you restore and stabilize the radio ulnar joint so montija another time ulnar fracture with proximal radio ulnar joint dislocation Gliazi, radius fracture distal radius one third fracture with distal radio ulnar joint um, dislocation so this is the difference between Gliazi and Montigia. Ah, oh, the most common fracture, the most common fracture in all age, especially, it's called Collis fracture. Collis fracture, it's the distal radius. It's the dinner fork. So what's the definition of Collis? It's a transverse fracture usually, extra articular. It's not an intra-articular. It's an extra articular of the radius, just proximal to the wrist with dorsal displacement and impaction okay so this is the definition of collis fracture it is the most common fractures of all in the older people okay it's usually postmenopausal osteoporotic women so thus the patient is usually an older woman who gives a history of falling down on outstretched hand so you've seen from this mechanism that the outstretched hand you have many fractures that may occur for example you have the scaphoid fracture you have the intraarticular wrist fractures. You have the distal radius, Collis or Smith. Sorry, Collis. Uh, you could have an elbow fractures. You could have shoulder dislocations. You can have clavicular fractures. So mechanism of injury in orthopedics is way, way, way important than any, any other thing. So it's very important to get good history. So Collis, you go outstretched hand, you give a dorsal displacement of the fracture. As you can see in this side, this is a distal radius fracture with dorsal displacement. The fracture result from forced dorsal flexion. So if a goalkeeper is trying to hold the ball and the ball come and compress the hand, very high energy trauma, okay, it's gonna give them a distal radius fracture with a dorsal displacement, which is Collis fracture. It looks like a dinner fork, and you can see in this X-ray, in this picture, sorry orthopedic surgeons always explain. So you can see in this picture that there is a dinner fork, which looks like a dinner fork. That's why the displacement is named like this. This is an X-ray, this is the radius in here, this is the ulna, you can see the transverse fracture. Sometimes there will be an ulnar styloid fracture. This is the dorsal displacement. It's going dorsally because outstretched hand, the force pushed the hand dorsally, it will give the displacement. Treatment usually for undisplaced fracture, you put a dorsal splint, okay? You put a dorsal splint, look for swelling, make sure there is no compartment, then the cast is complete after um, two, three, four days when the swelling gets down, we put a full cast. So we start with the back slab, then we go for full cast. Why we start with back slab? Because there will be swelling. If you put a full cast, there will be a risk of compartment syndrome. Okay, so just a prevention of compartment. After two weeks, we repeat the x-ray to make sure that it's not displaced. In four to six weeks, the fracture will be healed and the story is over. If displaced, must be reduced. We give usually sedation for the patient. If it's not getting reduced, you can give general anesthesia, traction, extension, and disimpaction. Okay, so again, traction. Most of the fractures, we have to do <coughs> traction along the axis of the bone to do this impaction. Okay, sometimes we do extension so we can manipulate the piece. Then we do flexion, okay? Flexion with ulnar deviation with pronation. So these are the techniques how to reduce a collis fracture. So traction to do this impaction, flexion because we are against the force. The force was extension, so we are doing flexion with not radial, ulnar deviation with pronation of the hand. And we put the back slab if the uh, reduction was okay. If it's irreducible, either we go with K wires, we put some small pins, or we can go for open reduction and internal fixation with a plate. Usually the outcome is, is good. When it's poor outcome, when there is shortening more than two millimeters in the distal radio ulnar joint, so the distal radio ulnar joint should not be variable length. 
should be restored because it's, it's a joint. Dorsal tilt. What's dorsal tilt? If you take an angle, okay, if you take an angle, this is volar tilt, dorsal tilt. If the radius is giving dorsal tilt more than 10 degrees, it's not acceptable. And dorsal translation, if the radius is going dorsally more than 30%, it's not acceptable. So these are, as I told you, each one has acceptable and unacceptable reduction. If it's acceptable, you go for conservative. If it's not acceptable, you try reduce. If it's not reduced, surgery. Complications, complications, complications. Um, nerve injury media, nerve compression. Sometimes you have to go post distal radius fractures to, to release the median nerve, tarpal uh, tunnel. Uh, RSD, which is pain, swelling, and vasomotor instability. Layered malunion, delayed union, and non-union. Stiffness, stiffness. Oh, stiffness is one of the most worst complications you will ever have. And EPL rupture. EPL rupture, which is extensor pollicis longus. So extension, okay. This is flexion of the thumb. This is extension. So extensor pollicis longus, it might be ruptured as a late complication of the distal radius fractures, usually collis. So the, the patient will have problem extending the thumb. Okay, so that's all or most of the things for collies. On the other hand, you have Smith fracture. Smith fracture, it's called reverse collies. It's also very common. The difference between Smith and collies by the mechanism of injury, that collies is coming on outstretched hand, Smith, on the other way around. That's it. That's why it's called reverse collies. That one was called dinner fork. This is called garden spade. So it looks like a garden spade because the distal radius fracture is not going dorsally this time. It's going volarly, okay, or ventrally. This is x-ray. You can see AP and lateral. This is the AP, both bone fracture. You can see the overlap between these two bones. They have translation. They have overlap, shortening. On the lateral view, you can see the volar displacement of the distal piece. Usually when you want to describe the displacement in the x-rays, we are describing the distal piece in comparison to the proximal. So in this x-ray, this is the distal, this is the proximal, the distal piece is going with angulation volary, okay? Volary or ventrally. So this is not collies, it's Smith fracture. Treatment and treatment and treatment another time. Mechanism of injury, you do the reverse of it. So the patient fell down on a volary, on a volary displaced. So you have to do extension this time. In collis, we did flexion. Now we do extension, okay, with supination. Collis, pronation with flexion, here extension and supination. So it's, it's exactly uh, the other way around. On x-ray, another time, back slap, we change it after three, four days in the full cast, and we do an x-ray after two weeks, and after four to six weeks, you're done. Radiocarpal fractures. So uh, the most common fracture we will talk about in the radiocarpal injuries, it's called the radial styloid fracture. As you can see in this x-ray, this is the radial styloid, and you can see the transverse fracture through it, which is called chauffeur fractures. Why chauffeur fractures? Because the chauffeur usually is driving the truck or something, he's moving his hand on the steering wheel and something blocks it. So he continues moving. So there will be ulnar deviation against an action of the hand. So it will avulse the piece of the um, radial styloid. Radial styloid fracture is an intraarticular fracture. So you know the rest. Intraarticular fracture, anatomical reject reduction, rigid fixation. Either it's not displaced, you go for um, a back slap and a cast. If it's displaced, you go do reduction. If it's still reducible, we put pins, K wires, and so on. So this is an X-ray showing here some K wires were put in the radial styloid to fix it. This is the AP view. This is the lateral view, and you can see here the cast was put after the surgery. Fracture subluxation. Fracture subluxation, which is Barton fracture. Barton by definition. So we are done now with Collis and Smith. Both of them, they are extra-articular. Now, if we go to the intra-articular, the first fracture we will talk about is Barton. 
Barton, which is intra-articular fracture. Intra-articular fracture. Intra-articular, you can immediately say the next two things. Anatomical reduction, rigid fixation, or absolute stability. This is very important. So, Barton is an intra-articular fracture with volar subluxation. So, the joint is subluxated in here, okay? So, through Barton injury is volar fracture of distal radius associated with volar subluxation of the carpus can be mistaken with, with the Smith. Sometimes if you look at the X-ray, and we will just see now, that you may think that volar Barton sometimes is Smith. But how can we know that the difference? Number one, Barton is intra-articular, Smith is extra-articular. Barton, there is subluxation of the joint, Smith, there is no subluxation in the joint. What's the treatment? Because it's intra-articular fracture, open reduction, internal fixation, anatomical reduction, rigid fixation, okay? Okay, so on the right side, colleagues, we already talked about it, and Smith, extra-articular, one is dorsal, one is ventral. Barton, look at Barton, it's the fracture is going into the joint. Ventral Barton, the fracture is going into the joint. Okay, so the joint space is involved. That's why we have to get anatomical reduction and rigid fixation. So the first type of Barton, we have ventral. Ventral subluxation and we have dorsal subluxation. Have we seen in this picture? You can see in the third line in here, intraarticular with volar, intraarticular with, sorry, dorsal and ventral. So the treatment, reduction, K wires, anatomical reduction, rigid fixation, intraarticular. Sometimes we have comminuted intraarticular fractures in young adult, which is very bad. Because comminution in the intraarticular, we will be playing puzzles in the, inside the surgery. We do an open reduction, we try to reduce the pieces, but sometimes you have bone loss, we put bone graft, sometimes you have comminution in the intraarticular side while you are doing the surgery. You want to do perfect anatomical reduction, but you can't. That's why sometimes you can get um, late osteoarthritis. Um, CT is very important sometimes to plan the pieces, to plan your surgery, your approach, okay? So as much as possible, we have to go for anatomical reduction. In complications for radiocarpal fractures, um, osteoarthritis, very important. Osteoarthritis, especially for the intraarticular. And redisplacement, that's why we have to keep on follow up. If you've chosen that this uh, fracture is reduced, it's acceptable reduction, Intraarticular, you have to follow up your patient on a weekly basis until you get your fracture consolidated. Otherwise, it might be displaced. Uh, for the anal signed wrist injury, the distal radio anal joint we already talked about, we have something called the TFCC. The TFCC, what's the TFCC? It's called the triangular fibrocartilage complex. It's a complex ligament, okay? And meniscus, it's between the radius and the ulna. It gives very, good stability for the ulnar side of the wrist. It's very important. Um, and it's injury, sometimes you cannot really diagnose unless you do proper X-rays or MRIs. So there should be a high index of suspicion on the distal radius injuries or distal ulnar injury, radio ulnar joint. So you have to always to think about the TFCC. Um, piano key sign, if you see a piano key sign, please don't miss any injury in the TFCC. Lateral X-ray, I told you it's important with a pronated hand, so you can see the level of the ulna and the radius. You look for the radial stenode, and sometimes you do arthrogram. What's arthrogram? We get a dye, and we inject the dye inside the joint, and we do an X-ray. Now you can see the cartilage, now you can see the joint space, much better because you put a dye, which is radio-opaque inside the joint. This is called arthrogram. Um, usually, ulnar styloid fracture are too small to fix. Either a small K wire cannot go inside. So, uh, usually, you put in supination for six weeks. If it's large, we go and fix open reduction and internal fixation. The problem, usually, it gives you chronic pain if it's not reduced very well. And that's it. Carpal injuries. Carpal injuries for the carpal bone, uh, it's really common. It's very common. It's very greatly in type and severity. We have many bones and we will talk about them in a minute. This should never be uh, regraded as isolated injury. And I don't wanna say never, it's most, 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 most probably, it's not an isolated fracture. So if you see a fracture in one of the carpal bones, scaphoid, lunate, or the uh, trapezium, hamate fracture, pisiform, 
if you see a fracture of one of these bones, make sure that there are no other injuries around. Usually there is another injury because it's very hard to get only isolated injury. But sometimes you can get, which is very rare, very rare. Uh, most carpal bone fractures occur in the proximal row. So we have a proximal row and we have distal row. We will talk about them in a minute. Scaphoid for sure, it's the most common uh, sadly injured bone in the carpal bones. Bad luck bone. Uh, carpal bone fracture usually occur in younger people because you know, more active uh, sports injury, falling on outstretched hand and so on. X-rays. The most important thing, maybe for the humerus, you will accept an X-ray that you won't accept it to the hand. Why? Because for the carpal bones, you have to get a high quality films. Don't accept any X-ray. So have, you have to check for the view, the exposure, the joints, the roll of two. You have to make sure it's a high quality film. You have to get three views, not only two. AP, lateral, and special views, which is oblique, or it's called scaphoid view. Initial X-ray, usually, it gives you an impression that the patient is normal, but some fractures, you can't see until two or three weeks, like scaphoid fractures. If you have a patient with a scaphoid fracture, not displaced, you do an X-ray immediately, you see nothing. So what to do? Tenderness on the snuff box. Oh, this is a scaphoid fracture until proven otherwise. So treat him as a fracture and bring him after two weeks, repeat the X-ray. Okay. Carpal bones. What are the carpal bones? How many are the carpal bones? So we have the proximal row and the distal row. So as you, as you can see in the mouse in here, in the cursor, this is the proximal row, okay? The ABC, and we have the distal row. So in the proximal row, we have the scaphoid, which is the biggest, the second biggest after the capitate for shoot. So this is the scaphoid, then the lunate, then the triquitrum, and it's overlapped by the PC4. So triquitrum and PC4 are just uh, over each other. Then we go for trapezium, trapezoid, this is trapezium, this is trapezoid, and the larger one, which is called the capitate, and finally G, the hamate. So these are the carpal bones. The most common to be injured, scaphoid. Lunate has a specific disease, which is Kynbeck disease. Okay, so this is the most important things. The biggest one is the capitate. It's very hard to get fractures isolated. Um, for the scaphoid, 75% of the carpal fractures is for the scaphoid. Stable, unstable, okay, there is a classification, Herbert, we will talk about it in a minute. The combination of forced carpal movement, compression, dorsal flexion of the hand, so outstretched hand will give you a fracture in the scaphoid. Most of them are stable, you put them in a brace, okay, but we have a problem with the blood, blood supply, for the scaphoid. What's the problem? That it takes its blood supply from distal to proximal, so it's retrograde. That's why proximal pole of the scaphoid, it has a high incidence of a vascular necrosis, especially after waist fractures. So, before going to the, anat uh, let's see the anatomy. As you can see here, this is the distal part. This is the proximal part. Here, it's called the waist of the scaphoid. So if you have a fracture in the waist of the scaphoid, you might get ABN in the proximal pole because the artery is going retrograde. Okay, so the appearance, okay, maybe normal on X-ray, that's why you have to examine the patient. There will be tenderness on the anatomical snuff box. What's the snuff box? If you do extension of your thumb, you will find two tendons in here, okay? These two tendons are the extensor pollicis longus, okay, the extensor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis. These two extensors between them is called the snuff box. So this snuff, snuff box, if you find tenderness for a patient who's on outstretched hand, there is redness, swelling, and tenderness in here, treat him as scaphoid fracture. Bring him after two weeks, redo the x-ray and redo the examination to make sure. So AP lateral and scaphoid view, make sure the, narrow, the narrowest part is the waist, there is no fracture, blood supply, avascular necrosis is important. Few weeks you will see the union, delayed union or non-union you can see it also and you can see how can we diagnose non-union that the fracture is not united, there is uh, AVN, avascular necrosis, you will find the proximal part looks more white 
So it's sclerosis, sclerotic bone, dead bone. Uh oh, you have a vascular necrosis. This is called herpet classification, type A and B. A stable, B unstable, as easy as that. Type A, either tubercle of the scapula, of the uh, scaphoid, sorry. Type A2, which is incomplete fracture of the waist. Okay, they are good fractured, usually heals well because the risk of AVN is much lower. In B, displacement, more AVN. Type 1, it's oblique fracture through the waist. Type B2, which is a complete fracture of the waist. Type 3, proximal pole fracture. So why B3 is worse than B1, for example? Because the blood supply is coming from proximal to distal, and here will be much more diminished risk of AVN is more. B4, which is perilonate fracture dislocation. So there will be dislocation in the scaphoid bone. Proximal pole fracture, waist fracture, tubercle. Okay, so as classification of Herbert, if you go back, you can classify these fractures. Um, this is one of the x-rays you can see in here. This is a waist fracture. After a long time, there is signs of non-union. Treatment, what to do? If it's not displaced, you put the patient in plaster in a position it's called glass holding position. How can we do this? Look at this. This is a glass. Glass holding position, remove. This is the glass holding position. Okay, so we put them in a thumb spike. You can see we fix the uh, thumb, okay, until uh, this, we, we fix the CMC joint for sure, okay, because we are fixing joint above and joint below. And we put it for eight weeks, okay. It takes a long time to heal, yes, because it has poor blood supply. After uh, eight weeks, remove the cast, do the x rays, do the examination. Any signs that there is a still, or sometimes you can do CT, any signs there is still a fracture you put the uh, cast for another four weeks. I know it's hard, long time, you may get stiffness, muscle wasting, weakness, but we have to make the scaphoid heal. Sometimes if it's displaced, we can do open reduction, internal fixation. If there is non-union, we can do open reduction. We put bone graft and internal fixation. We do compression with screws. So we can get primary bone healing. So screws, we compress it. Now there is rigid fixation, anatomical reduction, primary bone healing, the cutting cones, if you remember from the first lecture. Lunate. In the lunate, we will not talk about it too much. The most common like disease you will be asked about in most exam is the lunate avascular necrosis, which is Kynebuck disease. Kynebuck disease. So Kynebuck disease is an avascular necrosis for the lunate, it has many causes. It could be trauma, it could be idiopathic, someone on cortisone, on a patient who's having other diseases, comorbidities, osteoporosis, a lot of risk factors for kind of disease. It's still not very well known, but the lunate, there have stages, one, two, three, four. Stage one is normal radiography. Stage two, lunate, you get sclerosis without collapse. The height is maintained. In three, there will be fragmentation and collapse. So we have 3A and 3B. 3A is carpal collapse without carpal collapse. 3B is with collapse of the carpus. Stage four, which is the last stage, degenerative changes around the lunate. So we will get osteoarthritis. Treatment depends on the stage and the age and the function and so on. A lot of treatment, uh, depending on, you can start with bracing and painkillers. If the patient is old and so on, you can do fixation, perilunate. Uh, fixation for, or it's called a proximal row carpectomy. You can go and fix the proximal row. You have a lot of uh, options. It's not for the medical student like to discuss it, but there are a lot of options just to know the kind of disease, what are the causes, the risk factors, and possible treatments. Okay, so we're done with the carpal bones, anatomy of the uh, hand. As you can see that the metacarpals in here, if you look for the metacarpals and the phalanges, they all are treated as long bones, as long bones. So they have epiphysis, articular surfaces, they have metaphysis, and they have long bone diaphysis. So it's treated like a femur or a humerus. Same principles, extra articular, maintain length, alignment, and rotation, a functional reduction, and uh, 
functional reduction and relative stability. So the hand injuries is the commonest of all because you're always using your hands. The first thing to do when you have a trauma is to put your hand, so it's the commonest injury. But you have to get perfect function. That's why we have to treat them very well. The general principles, x-rays at least three views. So you have to get like AP lateral and oblique, three views, okay? Um, assessment for neurovascular is very important for the hand and the digits, okay? Including tendon injuries. So you have to check for tendons. It's very important. Flexors and extensors, you have to check for the tendons. Uh, angular deformity, you have, we have to make sure that there is no rotation. As I told you in the first lecture, the bone can accommodate the in the axis and the flexion and extension can accommodate a bit of angulation but rotation no so acceptable reduction another time so flexion and extension so if you have rotation of one of the fingers it will be flexed there and there will be a problem or in the hand function that's why angular deformity is important to diagnose ap lateral and oblique um, Fracture of the small bone of the hand heals more rapidly than the large bones. Incorrect splintage may cause you stiffness. Stiffness is very bad, as I told you. One of the worst complications is stiffness. That's why hold internal fixation or external, then return to function as soon as possible. You remember the glass holding position, position for the scaphoid? There is something called the position of safety. For the, for the hand when you want to uh, put your slab, which is metacarpophalangeal joint, flexed at least 70 degrees, 70 degrees. And the interpharyngeal joint are almost straight. So you put this in the position of safety. Why it's safety? Because when you remove your slab, your, your patient is able to do flexion and extension again for the fingers to use the hand. If you do it straight, he will never be able to do flexion again, and if you do it in flexed hand, you, we can do extension. So it's very important. Um, metacarpal base fracture, the base of the second and third metacarpal usually is stable injury. Uh, make sure that there is no rotation, okay? It's very important. The fourth and fifth, they are more mobile, so they are more easily uh, dislocated or uh, displaced. You have to reduce, and usually the reduction is with traction, either flexion or extension, depending on the deforming forces. The thumb. The thumb is very important. Sometimes you might get when you have a box like this, or you have an axial force, so you get impacted fracture. It's called boxer fracture. And as you can see here, uh, we've done with the boxer fracture, okay? The most important thing, angulation less than 30, okay? Angulation less than 30. If it's more than 30, you have to go for open reduction. Bennett's fracture. So we have two intraarticular fractures for the CMC joint, CMC carpometacarpal joint. Okay, These, this joint, they have two uh, very important fractures, Bennett and Rolando. So in Bennett fracture, you see both of them, they are intraarticular fracture. The difference is the shape. So Rolando is a T or Y, Bennett, as you can see in this X-ray. Okay, so this is Bennett fracture. It's intraarticular fracture. And for sure, abductor pollicis longus tendon is working. That's why there is a deforming forces. The abductor pollicis longus is working on the fracture, so it's deforming the fracture. Another X-ray you can see in here, the Bennett fracture. The treatment, closed reduction, okay? Then abducting, abducting, okay? And extending the thumb, okay? So it's very important, this is abduction, abduction. So abducting and extending the thumbs and put k wires. Rolando, intraarticular, but the problem is that it's multi-fragments. So it's either T or Y fracture. So look at this picture. It's an intraarticular, like a T or Y, comminuted fracture. You can see the line in here. This is the difference between Rolando, Rolando and Bennett. Metacarpal fractures, metacarpal shaft fractures, I told you, long bones, the same, transverse, oblique, spiral, depending on the mechanism of injury, you treat them as long bones. Uh, if it's acceptable reduction, you go for splintage. If it's not acceptable, you go for open reduction and internal fixation. It's either with screws, plates, you have many screws and many plates, they can fit in the metacarpals of your hand. 
very common, very common metacarpal neck fracture is called boxer fracture. So what's boxer? The patient wants to get a box. Usually it's hit by the fifth metacarpal. It will give you ventral or volar angulation, as you can see in this X-ray in here. This is a ventral or volar angulation. We have acceptable and non-acceptable reduction. If it's more than 30, it's not acceptable. You have to reduce and splint if it's less. Uh, you can do splinting. We, say, we call it cobra shape splint. Okay, that's if it's undisplaced. If, it's in, if it is displaced, you can reduce and we put K wires inside, which is closed reduction with percutaneous pinning, which is called CRPP, closed reduction with percutaneous pinning. Uh, complication, you can feel a bump. This is a complication with some pain in the knuckles. Metacarpal hand fractures usually happens for um, direct blow. Sometimes they may be open because of crushed injury. Uh, don't forget compartment syndrome for the hand. The phalanges. The phalanges, same fractures, long bones, transverse, spiral, comminuted, avulsion. Why? Because there are a lot of tendons, like flexor uh, pollicis longus and the flexor digitorum, either superficialis or profundus. So all of these tendons, they might avulse, or the extensor, uh, extensor digitorum, all of these, they might avulse bone. Metaphysial fractures or intraarticular. Intraarticular anatomical reduction, rigid fixation. It's the same, the same trauma. They have same principles you are applying on each bone. The difference is the acceptable reduction, the angles. Um, undisplaced fracture, you do something called body strapping. So if you have a fracture in here, you can do body strapping. You put strap on both of these, the middle and the fourth, for example, until it gets healed. This is called body strapping. If it's displaced, reduce and put a brace. If it did not work, you can go for k -wares. Be careful of stiffness. Again and again, stiffness is your enemy. Terminal phalanx fracture, sometimes we have called tuft fracture. Tuft fracture with very distal bone fracture. It's sometimes because when the people are doing hammering or a door catches your finger, it's very painful, very painful hematoma. So in the emergency room, you have to evacuate the hematoma. It's called subungal hematoma. So how can we evacuate the hematoma? You bring a needle and you do a hole in the nail. The blood will go out and the pain will be relieved. It's a throbbing pain. You will feel your heart is pumping in your finger. Mallet. Mallet injury, very common very common, which is avulsion of the most distal part of the extensor tendon. So usually it's a very common picture that someone is falling down and his finger is held by a rock. So it could give you this picture, which is a mallet uh, finger. This is an X-ray, which is an avulsion fracture. What's avulsion fracture? That the tendon keeps working, the muscle action of the extensors keeps working, the finger forced flexion, there will be avulsion fracture. What to do? The treatment, very easy. Okay, the treatment is immobilization in special mallet finger splint. This is called mallet finger splint. It keeps the DIP extended, but leave the, the PIP, it can work, but it will keep it, this, the DIP fixed. If the tendinous avulsion, if it's tendinous, eight weeks. Eight weeks, then four weeks at the night. So the length will be 12 weeks, imagine. If it's bony, it's only six weeks because the bones heal faster, much faster than ligaments. Complications, non-union, persistent drop, swan neck deformity like this. And we will talk about it, which is imbalance of the extensor mechanism can cause in the laxed joint individuals. So you will find that DIP is flexed like this, the DIP is flexed and the PIP is hyperextended. So this is called swan neck deformity. Um, a version of the flexor tendon is like the uh, mallet finger, but it's the other way around. Okay, usually flexor digitorum profundus, flexor digitorum profundus, you know that the insertion of the profundus in here. Okay, so the flexor digitorum profundus will uh, catch the muscle, will do a vulgin fracture. The superficialis usually is here. So the examination, how do you examine for the profundus? You fix the DIP. Okay, and you let the patient move only the PIP. If it's moving, the profundus is working. Like this, the superficialis is working. So don't be fooled by 
the two tendons are working on each other. That's why you have to isolate when you do the examination of the profundus. So isolated injuries. In the joint injury, we have carpometacarpal dislocation, as you can see in this picture, for sure. Any dislocated joint, reduce, reduce, reduce. So any dislocated joint, you have to reduce. Um, Carpophalangeal dislocation is the same, as you can see in this picture. Here is dislocation, what to do? Reduction. Interphalangeal joint dislocation, same thing. It's very easy to reduce. Sometimes you have to get a fracture uh, to X-ray because you might get a fracture, don't miss it. So this is all for the fractures of the upper limb. It's very more like or wide or more details, but these are just the basics for medical students and young doctors. And we will continue hopefully in the next lectures.